Welcome back to our series on the Apostles. And tonight we are going to present a, quite a challenge, Judas Iscariot. People would be uncomfortable with the thought and to spend time dwelling on him takes a decision. And I would say that many people would approach him with negativity from the beginning, a certain burden, maybe a dislike, maybe a fear, and I suggest that we look at how Jesus saw Judas and the great closeness Jesus offered to him with the goal of redeeming him. And we have a lot to learn. None of the Gospels have erased the name of Judas and all the paintings of the Last Supper have him. So let us <clears throat> approach Judas with a spirit of faith. Christ chose him and he's part of God's plan. He's in God's plan and also it's beyond us to make the final call and judgment. Judas is always listed as one of the twelve. He's at the last at the end of the list, the last of the twelve, usually in the list. And Peter, in the Acts of the Apostles, when he is moving the Apostolic College to elect a replacement for Judas, he calls him, he was one of us. And in the Gospel we have a number of texts where he is described as uh, sharing in the mission of the twelve. We look at Judas' name and it comes with a lot of pedigree. The fourth son of Jacob, Yehuda, is the Hebrew origin for this name. And we have probably three ways to say it in English. We have Judas, and another form of that same name is Judah. And so we have Judas, uh, Judah uh, Tadeus. Um, another apostle, one of the twelve also, he has the same name as Judas. And then we have, uh, he's also called Jude, um, in English vernacular, in English usage. So these three names are from the same Hebrew name and they're probably distinguished because of the unique way Judas' life developed, and he's called Judas, which is the Greek and Latin form of his name. Judas Iscariot, Ish is a man, and from Kariot. There's a Kariot near Hebron and a Kariot here in the north near Haifa. So that could be an explanation. There are also other attempts at explanations about his name. Jesus chose Judas, just like he chose each of the apostles. We don't seem to have an account of that moment, but we know that Jesus loved him. And we can say something very concrete. Jesus trusted him. And that raises obviously a big question. How do we know Jesus trusted him? Well, let me ask you a question. Let's say you start some organization, even Stamp Collectors Association or a football association or a golf club or whatever you want to start and you will have somebody who's in charge, a chairman, a president, some leader uh, position, then you'll have a secretarial position to keep the records, and then you will have a treasurer. Who do you put in as treasurer? Somebody with smarts and somebody you can trust. Now the Gospel of John raises issues about the uh, trustworthiness of Judas saying he was a thief, which is a very strong uh, word. Why did Jesus do this? you can have all kinds of speculation. Sometimes people give people a special role to have them closer. And Jesus is coming to save mankind, to save the lost, to save the sinners. And the tough case is he needs to have them close. And so he's in regular contact with Judas because of his activity. Just remember at the Last Supper, the apostles thought that Jesus was sending Judas to get some provisions or to give something to the poor. So that just is a little hint that Jesus would have often asked Judas to do things and he'd probably have come back and told Jesus how it went. So there we see 
and intentionality in Jesus' relationship with Judas. And his bigger intentionality is way beyond the physical contact. It's to touch his soul, to ease his burden, to give him light, to give him grace, to give him opportunities of trust. And this is very important in relationships. An important question is why did Judas betray Jesus? And there's been much speculation about this. Was he dissatisfied with his messianic clan? It didn't square with Judas' expectations. Was there some other passion inside his heart? Did he try to force the plan to work? He kind of did a trigger motion. He didn't wait for Jesus in Jesus' time. It's very hard to penetrate this reason. Were there political movements? Was it a matter of destiny? But there's one very disturbing note, which is also around us all the time. The devil put it in his heart. Luke um, says that Satan entered into Judas, who was of the number of the twelve. So we have these two texts from John and Luke, and that uh, also obliges us to put this completely in God's hands. In God, only God can judge. Let's go to the Last Supper. Jesus cared for Judas. He washed his feet at the Last Supper. Jesus doesn't expose him as he goes forward to betray him from the Last Supper. Jesus accepts his betrayal in Gethsemane. And Jesus questions his kiss. We are lucky to be here in this environment where the moon is rising because it's a full moon tonight here in Magdala and it's a full moon in Gethsemane when Judas comes to hand over Jesus. It's interesting that Peter strikes with the sword and Jesus has to repair that damage. It's interesting that Jesus allows Judas to go forward with his betrayal, which had started with the deal for 30 pieces of silver. But then we see that Judas repents and he goes and gives back the money. Then we know from the scriptures that he hung himself. And obviously that's a very serious deed. And so it goes beyond our scope to judge him. That's in God's hands. Let us come back to ponder Judas more in the second unit.